morning, Bios Cosmos Church, and welcome to our first Sunday school class of the year. So today, um, today we're going to talk about something that's just a little, how do I put this, a little controversial. So how is everybody doing today? Is everybody doing well? People, how ready are you for the next stage of your enlightenment? How ready are you to lay down who you are and what you are before Christ and allow him to take charge of your life? And children, how many of you are ready to follow Jesus for the first time yourself? Even if it isn't your first time, how many of you are willing to continue following Jesus? Well, there are many things we have to do in order to do this. However, above all these things is love. Love is above all, which is why today we are going to talk about our enemies. So many people say they don't have enemies. Many people say they do have enemies. But what many of us don't know is what is considered an enemy is not 100% to do with whether or not we feel somebody is going to hurt us, but whether or not somebody is trying to hurt us in any way. So it does not have to be physical. It does not have to be psychological. It can be in any way. Is someone trying to make you lose your job? Is someone trying to get you kicked out? Is someone trying to cause you to make less money? Is someone trying to impede your ability to be happy? These are all things that enemies do. Now, let's stand for prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for bringing us together in the house of the Lord. Thank you for teaching us your holy word and allow it to remain within our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So today is going to be a pretty small discussion about responding to our enemies. As you know, it's pretty hot, but you know, we could... There's only two things that we could do to respond to it. We could either sit here and complain all day about the heat, or we could just learn the word of God and be happy in the word of God. Eventually, supernaturally, we will be relieved. So, if you have this book, called The Most Significant Teachings in the Bible. That's going to be our Sunday school book for this year. So there are a few scriptures that are going to get read today. Some of them are on the board behind me. <laughs> but here's the thing. One thing we have to realize is that returning evil for evil never works. It never works. Now, here's the thing. The 
let's, let's take a look at our first scripture. Our first scripture is going to be Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. So look at this. A gentle response has the power to diffuse someone's wrath. Now, in today's society, it's considered normal to want to return evil to people who have done evil to you. If you don't return evil for evil, you are looked at as a weak person. However, how strong or how weak someone is should not be determined by the very nature of their response. It should be determined by the very nature of the reaction of their response. Because look at this one thing. When you return evil for evil, when you give the devil a foothold in your life, when you walk out of the situation thinking you feel better, but really you're disturbed, when the person who you've returned evil to gets worse and then returns evil back to somebody, anybody else, were you really successful in mitigating the circumstances? Because look, look at how fights work. Um, fights typically end because somebody is unable to return evil or return a punch. People would keep beating each other back and forth, and the fight will only end when the first person is no longer able to beat the other person. This is usually taken up in the form of a knockout, usually in the form of the person giving up, usually in the form of the other person getting tired. Fights only stop because somebody is unable to fight. So if this can happen in a negative way, why can't it happen in a good way where the first person who receives the punch just chooses not to punch back? People look at people as weak when they back down from a fight. As you can tell, well, you can't tell this, but me, I personally have never punched back in a fight. I don't get into physical altercations. Somebody would punch me in the face or kick me, whatever. I don't get in physical altercations because as big as I am, it may not be believable. I just run away. I just walk away. I'm just going to leave. I've never been in a physical altercation because... My reaction to a physical altercation is to just leave. That's it. So that's how come any time I ever get, you know, into what anybody would consider a fight, really it's just uh, somebody punched me in the face and that's it. Somebody, yeah, just one hit. So that's really what it is. And then another tactic that can be used is kindness. So we don't have to just refuse to return the evil that, the, that they have given us. We could be kind through it too. Because look at this. Let's think of our unkind actions as adding, as, you know, supply. So when we think of unkind actions, we're thinking of supply. We do not want to provide this supply to our enemies because the more supply we pass to the enemy and the more supply they pass back to us, supply being negativity, 
the more this is going to create a divide. Now, there are different types of enemies. Um, you could have basically domestic enemies, which that would be people who you know, people who you are around, your circle. So people that's in your circle, your family, your friends, uh, the city you live in, your neighborhood, anything that directly affects you is a domestic enemy. And then you have an external enemy, which is somebody that's in a completely different community, completely different area, completely different anything that is opposite of you, that is not in where you are. It could be ran strange, random people that you don't know. So that's a different community right there. So with that, uh, it depends. If it's with a complete stranger, a wall could get built up. Um, it's not going to take as long. Believe it or not, the most dangerous attacks can come from the people that are immediately around you. Why? Because people that are immediately around you, they know everything about you. They know who you are, what you do, how you react, how you feel. They know everything. Therefore, making it completely easier for you to, for them to attack you and even in the worst possible ways. So how can we do this? Well, we can be kind. Kindness to enemies disrupts evil. Kindness to enemies break down walls. So we're going to look at our first scripture. How can we be kind to our enemies? Today's sermon that we're doing in church today is going to focus more on loving your enemy. And you're going to see me having to do this for a few more days because every Bible in the building is brand new. So you're going to see me having to um, unwrap Bibles for a few days. Every time I come on the air, I might, I had, I don't, I didn't have to unwrap one during service last week, but yeah, that's what happens when your stuff is all new. You just got to unwrap everything every time. So, try not to tear up the packaging. Uh oh. Let's see. Uh. Everything. Um. Okay. Pretty nice Bible. They're five dollars a piece. It has maps and it has King James and. Most importantly, it doesn't have all that extra stuff. It just tells you that it's a Bible. It's basic. Nothing expensive, nothing, you know. And then it has a nice covering on it, too. So, yeah. So, look at this. We're going to open our Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 23, verse 4 and 5. Exodus even has a concordance. Wow. Exodus chapter 23, verse 4 and 5. And it reads, starting at, at 4. If thou meet thy enemy's ox, or his ass meeted donkey going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. If thou see the ass of him, that means donkey, that have thee lying under his burden and wouldest forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help with him. So, 
This is saying, if you see your enemy struggling, you are obligated to help them. You need to help your enemies. You do not for any reason outcast or mistreat your enemies. You still should help your enemies. So when it says help them when they're in need, it literally means help them when they're in need. Many people, I've heard people say, well, if he's so bad or whatever, I don't like him so much that if I see him going to jail, I'm going to laugh. And you know what? That's going to come up next. Or if I see him in accident, I'm not going to help. Many people do this. And the reality is it's not biblical for us to refuse to help someone just because we don't like them. As a matter of fact, more often than not, the enemy is a likable person. You just don't like their actions. More often than not, you are disliking the person's actions and not the person. So we should go from, oh, this person's always stealing from me. I hate them so much. Our response should be, I hate when the person steals from me. So you don't hate the person, you just hate when they steal from you. So we, and by the way, a lot of people says hate is a strong word. The word hate in the Bible, when used in its biblical form, means to love less. So when you hate something, you are loving it less than things that does not do that particular actions. Many people think of hate as the strongest form of dislike, as absolute unending dislike. That is not biblical. So when we say we hate somebody, that doesn't mean that we don't like them or that there's a strong disliking. It means we love them, just not as much as the person that doesn't do what they do. Like, for example, I hate people who would refuse to repent for their sins. And I could openly say that because when you say you hate them, it biblically it means, yes, I love them, but not as much as people who do repent for their sins. So that's our first scripture. Help our enemies when they are in need. Now let's look at Proverbs chapter 24, 17. Proverbs chapter 24, 17. So this one is very unique. I like this one. This one is a good one because look, 2417 states, rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thy heart be glad when he stumbleth. And then let's look at 18. Lest the Lord see it, and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. So did the Bible just say that if you laugh at an enemy's um, fall, that um, God is just not going to punish them anymore? Did the Bible actually just say that? It's true. Will the enemy still be held accountable for his actions? In some cases, that probably won't even happen. Maybe in a modern day society where everything is about tit for tat, tit for tat, and a hit for a word, maybe. But will that be divine? Most likely not. When you rejoice in the downfall of your enemies, when you laugh at them, despite the fact that they are wrong, somebody's going to take their side. 
because somebody, there's going to be two types of people that takes the enemy's side. The first type of people is going to be people that knows the enemy did something wrong, but then say, no, he's been punished enough by your laughing. He's been punished enough by your rejoicing in his falling. You know, he's he, he's been uh, punished enough. Therefore, he doesn't need anything. Therefore, forget what he did. Now it's on you now. And then, of course, if you continue down, you're going to have the other type that just says, probably didn't even do it. They probably just said it to get him in trouble. You have two types of people that would do that. And here's the thing. What fun do you get out of watching somebody stumble worse than when you did? What fun is that? What's so funny about somebody getting hurt? Let's look at this. Pray for them. Pray for them. Matthew chapter 5, 44. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Now, when we open the book of when we open the book to Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, it reads, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despise which despitefully use you and persecute you. So look at this. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Now, when the enemy hates you, believe it or not, hate is not a normal, hate is not a real emotion. Hate, as used in modern terminology, is unlimited. So you can't hate somebody and then when they die or when they get sick or when they become unraveled, say that, oh, um, I wish I had gone that far. I feel bad. And you, know, you can't do that. That's not possible. So that means hate is technically biblical. You have to be able to have agape love in order to care that if I keep doing this, this person might die. That's agape love. As a matter of fact, I did mention last week that agape love is the basic, most basic type of love. Think of it as your basic television package where all you're going to get is the federally mandated channels. Usually it's free. Usually you can pick them up with an antenna. So that's TV. So here's the thing. Here is the thing. When you have things that, um, when you have things such as this, where you need to be able to pray for and love your enemies, that is not easy to do. It's not easy to pray for somebody that you feel doesn't like you. It's not easy to even tolerate your enemies. It's not very easy for somebody to say, well, I know you did this, but I'm going to go ahead and forgive you and do what is right here by just leaving it. We want it's human nature. We feel we should punish people. We feel that if they make us stumble, we should make them fall. We feel that in order to maintain honor, that we are supposed to put down everybody that gets in our way. Again, this is not biblical. Finally, I'm going to give you two more scriptures. Second Kings chapter 6. Verse 22 through 23. 
So this is going to be 2 Kings. Now, Kings is one of the smaller books in the Bible, so it's not exactly um, read from very often. Actually, I, I doubt if, I don't think I've ever actually read the book of Kings before, which that's good. You know why? Because we need to start expanding more of our books. So instead of reading the same material every time, we need to start going and exploring. Many of you probably have worked in fast food before. When you work in a fast food restaurant, your manager is typically going to tell you to try things on the menu, eat everything, don't eat the same thing every time or even twice, just try everything this way. You can use it as a selling point to customers. So this is what we need to do with the Bible. We as Christians need to try everything in the Bible, not both as reading it, learning it, and doing it, we need to try all of the skills that the Bible teaches, read all of the scriptures. There are just many things that we need to do. And this is strictly because if we do these things, we will in fact be able to show others a lot easier and a lot more efficiently and know too, because guess what? It's there, it's in us. So if you look at the book of 2 Kings chapter 6, and then we're going to go to the 22nd verse. 20, and he answered, Thou shalt not smite them, wouldest thou smite those who thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow. Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Now let's look at 23. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. And the part that really sticks out, yes, we're supposed to feed them when they're hungry. And this is both spiritually and figuratively. This is everywhere. So this is the, the, sum, the summarization point of the entire lesson. But look at this. Look at this, though. Thou shalt not smite them, wouldest thou smite those who thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow. So this applies for both enemies of you and enemies of your acquaintances. We always feel that when someone is abusing our loved ones, that we're supposed to just go in and launch all the punishment there's going to be. However, people has been known to, if someone takes the side visibly of the person that they are the enemy of, then they will just come back harder. Even business, even entire businesses do this. Sheriffs have been known to order people put in jail just because the person would tell you would show support for somebody the sheriff doesn't like. People, some people call it silencing. But the reality of the situation is that's just how enemies work. If you, many times, someone that has done something wrong, outcast the person and abuse them, they're going to take it out on somebody else. Remember, people who are perceived as enemies, who are real enemies, actually are very insecure because what does it take to be an enemy? Somebody who causes trouble. 
Somebody who is insecure will try to cause a lot of trouble. So when we take a look at it from this perspective, we have to know that the only way we're going to get rid of our enemies is to out nice them. I got that from one of my students in the youth class that says we have to out nice the people that are mean to us. And I've never heard it put that way before, but that is a very good saying because here's the thing. It's easy. They're not being nice. Why don't I be nice? They'll see it. Eventually, they're just going to do two things. It's either they try to change because guess what? When you bully someone that's been nothing but nice to you, people will take your side automatically. When you return fire with fire, but then go above what the bully do, meaning the bully throws something at you, you punch the bully, people are going to start taking the bully's side. So the best thing to do is to return good for evil. Not to return evil for evil, but return but return good for evil. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 12, verse 20. And this, as we continue here, it's going to show something. And then after that, we're going to look at some cross-references. Romans 12, chapter 20, it says, Therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Now, I want you to read down to 21. And by you, I'm reading from my Bible. You're hearing me read. Please don't just sit wherever you're sitting and just listen to me read. Take out your Bible. If you're on Marta or somewhere where they don't have Bibles, take your phone now. Go to kingjamesbible.org or Bible Gateway. Look up King James Version or whatever version suits you the best. And go to Romans chapter 12, verse 20, and read it using your eyeballs for yourself. So not just my ears, not just your ears in my voice, your eyeballs. Because there is nothing better than you reading the Bible and understanding it for yourself. For those of you who are a little more advanced or not there yet, I also strongly encourage you to turn to the concordance that is in the back of your Bible and look up more things as far as enemies, look up more scriptures, because the amount of scriptures we read today, that's probably not every scripture in the Bible. See that the average scripture in the Bible can be interpreted in almost an infinite amount of ways. Every scripture that has to do with love and kindness could be used to that effect. So let's continue down to 21 of chapter 12. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So you don't return evil for evil. You return evil, with, you return good towards evil. You have to overcome evil with good. So when someone does something evil, you don't go back and do something evil again, lest they shall return what you're evil for good. Mind you, you're the secure person. You are the figurative, you know, because we all know we're all actually adults. So you are the spiritual adult here. They're being the spiritual child. You, What happens when a kid throws a temper tantrum? You don't join in with the kid and start throwing the temper tantrum too. You, as the adult, are supposed to tell the kid what is expected of them and enforce it if you have to. That's what happens when we as spiritual adults deal with spiritual children that returns evil for every evil they receive. 
you are supposed to tell, you're supposed to show them that, hey, this is not what is right. Therefore, this is not what needs to be done. You're going to show them through example that just because you do this to me doesn't mean that I need to do this to you. I'm not going to say the part about me not supposed to. I'm just going to say the part about I want you to stop. If I don't give you supply, then you'll stop. It's psychology right there. So let's review what we did today. And this is what we did. Today, we learned one, help your enemies. I'm pretty sure I spell enemies wrong. Two, Proverbs chapter 24, 17, don't rejoice in their downfall. Three, pray for them. And then if you look at four, love them. Last one, be nice. So that's all of it. This is how we're supposed to treat our enemies. There's a few other things we could do, but this summarizes it. We're still supposed to love our enemies anyway. Why is this so hard to do? Again, human nature is the blame. It's not human nature to want to be nice to somebody that has hurt us. Now, this is how we're going to apply this to our life. In real life, we have people that we're not on the best terms with. Some people, all you have to do is hear about them and you'll get upset. We need to pray regularly for those people. We also need to pray that God can direct them. We can also pray and model for them, mainly for ourselves, how to do the word of God. The most powerful tool in the Bible is love. Love is the greatest weapon in the Bible. And the best part, you can take it anywhere. You can take it to school. You can take it through the TSA. You can take it on the airplane. And guess what? From I hear that you can take love, which, biblic, which is the most powerful biblical weapon. If you're allowed to take that on an airplane, then that's probably a very good. The fact that they're letting it on there, <laughs> that's probably a very useful thing. Because... Love, you can't take love anywhere because love has many different characteristics. And if you're on an airplane, you do need to have love with you. You know why? Because those airport people, some of them are very nice. Most of them, the, air, the companies, the airlines are just greedy. And we don't need to yell at the cashier at the check-in desk because she did not get on the radio and say, well, fly this and that. We're not taking off today. We're going to take off tomorrow. And guess what? I am 
we are not going to give the passengers their hotel vac vouchers. She, they never did that. He or she did not do that. As a matter of fact, the airline, the airport, the FAA most likely said that it was not safe to take off. Not the check-in desk person. As a matter of fact, the check-in desk person probably doesn't even know anything until you go in her face yelling and ranting. And she probably says, well, I don't know anything about this. I don't even know where, I don't even know where that particular plane is right now. It, it, did it take off? Did, did you miss your flight? They're, they're caught off guard. They don't know. And we do this to people many times often. You come, somebody doing the policy, you come and you yell at them about the policy. And the thing is, they don't even know what happened. They just know it's the policy. That's all. When we do these things, it needs to be out of love. It needs to have love involved. Because see, here's the thing. You can't take society and people and businesses and break it down into a science. You can't. It's not science. It's love. It's psychology, which is a type of science. But psychology is the most loving type of science. So it's still love. And when you look at all these things of how you're supposed to help your enemies this Despite the fact that you don't like them, you're still supposed to help them. You're still supposed to pray for them. You're still supposed to be nice to them, talk to them, whatever, all the humane things that we do to be nice to people as if nothing happens. You're still supposed to love them. And today in church, we will figure out what exactly does it mean to love your enemies and then, above all, when your enemies get knocked off of his pedestal, don't laugh at him. Don't rejoice in that. Don't. It's not biblical. So if you wish to leave right now, you are dismissed. However, we are going to continue with three more scriptures for those people who really enjoy cross-referencing the Bible um, the direction of service has ended, so this is the end of Sunday school. But those of you who enjoy cross-referencing and enjoy hearing cross-referencing scriptures and need additional proof, please stay for approximately five more minutes. Um, we are going to provide three cross-reference scriptures that can be helpful the thing about cross-referencing scriptures here is we're just going to give them to you. We're not going to elaborate. We're not going to have a whole discussion unless someone starts one. We're just going to give and read the scriptures. And the first scripture is going to be Proverbs chapter 25, verse 21 and 22. Now, I'm going to read this first one. Again, we don't elaborate. I want you to read it for yourself. So there's two more. I'm not going to read them. I'm just going to give them to you because that is rhetorical. We need to do it on our own independently. So let's look at 21 and 22 of the 25th chapter of Proverbs. And it reads, when we speak a fair, believe him not. For there are seven abominations in his heart. Oh, it's supposed to be 21 and 22. Let's look at 21 and 22. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. So that's rhetorical. I'm not going to give you any ideas on what it means. That is for you to figure out within your own heart. Now, let's look at Luke chapter 6, verse 27 through 36. You are also free to read that if you like. The last very good scripture 
for reference is going to be John chapter 15, verse 18 through 25. I have personally read that before, and that was good. So for those of you who are advanced learners, we're going to do that. If you like, message me. We could have a good discussion about it later on sometime this week, if it's even Sunday. But for now, we are ready to go and love our enemies. We are ready to give our enemies the same treatment as we're supposed to give. A lot of people says, do on the others as you want them to do unto you. However, here's the thing. People, if you know the song from the 1970s, Sweet Dreams Are Made Of This, some of them want to abuse you. Some of them want to be abused. Some of them want to use you. Some of them want to be used by you. So there's some people that will abuse people because that's all they know. They feel like that getting abused is just a normal way of life. They don't know it's abuse. They don't see it as abuse. They just think it's just, oh, it's so normal. So they're thinking that if, yeah, just, if you hear that scripture, they're probably just thinking, well, let's just do what I'm expecting in return. People, some people see themselves as less than. And when people see themselves as less than, what happened? They're not going to care if they get treated badly because they're used to it. They think it's supposed to be that way. So this is why I have something better for you. And this is an actual scripture. Do unto others as Christ has done unto you. Now, not what you want Christ to do, what Christ has done unto you. Do unto others as Christ has done unto you. Okay? So when we look at that, it's very important. Now let's stand up and pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for what our, our heart, mind, spirit, and soul has seen. Thank you for teaching the word of God and allow for it to remain within our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Again, help your enemies. Don't rejoice in their downfall. Pray for your enemies. Love your enemies and be nice to your enemies. All of us at some point in our life is going to have to do this because guess what? There is always going to be somebody better than you. There's always going to be somebody worse than you. And there will always be somebody that does not like you. So we have to be prepared at a moment's notice for the fire. Thank you and have a blessed day.